How's everybody doing today? We doing good? Let's see. Thanks for uh, being patient. I was a little bit late today. Okay, so let's get to, to what's going on. Um, basically, I got last couple weeks to spend a lot of testing, getting uh, Beth upgraded, getting other use cases upgraded. So there's been miscellaneous bugs that have been needing to be fixed. Um, you know, one little thing, one little thing, race condition, this, you know. Um, so far, the last, I think I had one bug to do last week, and then I haven't heard anything since then. So everything's been pretty solid. I got, like, the precision stuff done. That's all put in. Um, you know, one of the things that we had to do is, like, when you're doing an operator and a sum, for instance, um, you know, anytime you touch, like, the, the system, you know, double or floating point, um, it you know, it's, it's not like a, an actual precise value as far as they're considered. So I had to write my own class in order to handle that. And it's, it's working very well now. Um, I got it even to the point where it can preserve the number of digits, like pretty much all of the big engineering headaches that I've been not really super enthusiastic about fixing um, because I thought I was going to actually have to go into the JSON library and modify that. I managed to get it all working exactly as it should. So um, our figures are very accurate. It, it maintains the, the precision, you know, for the, you know, that specific token. When you're running any of the operators, um, I think there was one or two little bugs in some of the queries. And then we also, uh, something I don't think I've mentioned before, we've added variables. So you actually have variables or functions inside the query. So what that basically means is um, instead of having to type, for instance, if you want to do like, a damage query. Let's say I want all the transactions um, between this time and this time. You generally have to convert it into a Unix timestamp because that's what the registers store the, the timestamp as. A Unix timestamp, for those that aren't familiar, is the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970, right? Um, and so it's this, just this big long number. <clears throat> so I made it so that you can actually, you know, use variables and functions inside the query. So if you want to say, hey, you know, I need to get these date ranges instead of having to go into a Unix timestamp converter and, you know, get the Unix timestamp for those date ranges, um, you just type in date, right? And it's got a syntax where you have a semicolon that's required um, to, to designate that that's a specific function. So you type, you know, you put in the function date parenthesis and then type in the actual date and then it'll resolve that into a Unix timestamp for you. We have, I think there's four or five different variables inside so that you can basically you have access to to derive other pieces of information from it i had a bug that was kind of pressing this was a pretty uh, a complicated bug because it, it didn't really there was no real knowing exactly where it was coming from in um you know managing for beth and um, it was you know tokens were having issues um crediting and uh, through the fixing and resolving that i found um a lot of, how should I say, it? Um, I resolved that issue, but it, it brought to to question like the conditional contract. So I was having to debug the conditional contracts to make sure that there was nothing wrong in the conditional contract, why they were failing to execute, so on and so forth. And so, <laughs> knowing me, I find a problem and I build something that solves more problems than just that problem. So I built the query DSL. Um, or not the query DSL, the, the conditional contract DSL, domain specific language. So any of you that are actually running a 5.1 node, if you pull merging now and you do any sort of you know list transactions or anything like that, and you want to see the contract, if the contract has a conditional contract, it will actually output the conditional contract for you in human readable text. So that's done, which was really cool. I wrote that just to debug, and then I was just like, hey, okay, whatever, you know, I'll finish it. Um, so it doesn't have an input variation of it. This is just output, but you know all of that code's in there. So um, I'm probably going to include that in, in this next release so that people can actually feel what it feels like to code the conditional contract. Since the API is templated, um, I want people to see you know how the virtual machine works, how to create that Boolean logic, right? So that's all in, which is really cool. So that was an additional feature that I, I developed to fix a bug that ended up being, you know, another feature that we were, I think, reserving for 5.2 because I didn't want to really add too many new features, but this was something that was necessary in order to, to verify that. So any of you developers, you'll be able to start understanding how the syntax works um, for the conditional virtual machine. Um, so I want, I have that all in, in, in a type of boilerplate standards contract system 
um, where you can actually create the byte code for the contract and then generate it even including parameters and then it'll generate the actual conditional contract uh, byte code. So, you know, that's one step away from just adding the DSL on top of that. So I'm going to most likely be including that in the next update um, so that we have, you know, so it really you, like the API just, just it, it hasn't, we're not really upgrading any of the consensus critical code right now. We're adding API code that really exposes a lot of the functionality that's already been there. So that's one thing that, you know, I've been really fundamentally focused on in this, this recent update is, you know, really revealing all of these things that are possible in Nexus as it stands right now. So um, I fixed that bug and got all of that. And then we had just one more bug that was a, a race condition. Um, since then, I mean, Beth is, they're updated, they're running good. So I'm pretty sh safe to say that all of the hybrid mode, private mode stuff is well tested. It's working, no issues. Um, I've gotten through, you know, all the bug lists and the documents from Aonwise and Mike and all of them. So it, it's looking really good right now as far as that um, functionality solid. It, it's running fast, not having any issues. I've been focused on the testnet and legacy features um, this last week. I was doing a lot of bugs last week. So I have just a little bit of network layer stuff to do right now, which, you know, is I need to add beef up the, the network layer as far as like I, I developed a dynamic indexing system. I want to have that for if you're logged in to another node, I need to kind of shore up some of that code a little bit so that clients are going to have you know a lot more efficiency in that. And, you know, not just the clients, but the actual servers that are providing for those clients. Um, we got all these new DNS seeds in, which is cool. So if you, um, you know, to repeat that, if you are running a, a full node on a server somewhere, um, the more the merrier. It would be, you know, awesome if you wanted to just create a DNS record, point it to that, and then send the DNS record to me, and we can invite you into the seed node group. Um, to, to clarify, what a seed node does is it, it seeds unified time samples, and it also acts as the first node that you connect to um, when you join the network so that you can get a list of other addresses that you want to connect with. So that's all done. Um, yeah, I pretty much just have a little bit of beefing up on the network layer to do. I'm planning on getting that all done and turning it over to the wallet guys tomorrow by the end of day tomorrow. So um, they were having one issue with Android. Android just did a new operating system upgrade and it caused the, the node to, to not come up properly. So we're still debugging that. I'm going to be getting deeper into that once I, I pass it over to them. So hopefully that isn't um, anything that is a critical issue. I hope the operating system doesn't, doesn't try to block us running this external C++ program on it, but you know it should it should be okay. So we're just we're just fine tuning these last little details, um, and the mobile wallet is pretty much ready to go. So um, once you see the next version of the mobile wallet, the last version was to update some of the seed nodes um, that are used for clients. Now this next version will be with the new 5.1 core. Once we go through one beta cycle with that, we'll start the process of submitting it into the App Store, and that's when we'll do the official release for the 5.1. And that's where we're going to move into the 5.2 update. Um, 5.2 code has somewhat been developed, uh, been developing some aspects of it. Um, you know, we can use the, the lower level protocol to develop the, the messaging API and stuff like that. But so the 5.2 update is going to have a lot of really important things. We might break it up into multiples. Um, one of the really important ones is the file system. We really need that. Um, and that, like I said, before it, it'll allow you to just deploy a web service very easily where it very efficiently, um, it, it's kind of like a distributed hash table lookup, but it, it's using locator identifier separation protocol. I've also been developing that um, as I spoke, I think it was a couple AMAs ago, I've been speaking with Dino again, um, and we've been discussing, they're actually having key management issues, surprise, <laughs> with uh, list crypto, where you have an EID that's tied to an actual cryptographic identifier um, we, I'm helping them and finishing our draft for the IETF. I'm, I'm making a modification to that specific protocol so that, you know, we're going to include Nexus in, you know, some of that, that key management. So there's one use case already, um, in a really pretty well prominent, you know, area with the internet engineering task force. Um, potentially we could work on, you know, developing a, an informational RFC or something like that. I'll be talking with Dino about that. Um, to, I'm going to be contributing some more documents into the IETF so that we can start getting some of these standardized, such as our decentralized login system, um, you know, where it is using public key cryptography, but, you know, it's levered in your actual SIG chain. So for anyone that's not familiar um, with, you know, the, how that's going to work, 
Um, if you have a Gmail account and you have a YouTube app, they use the YouTube app as the two-factor authentication for your Gmail. So if you've ever logged into your Gmail on a separate device, it'll ask you to, to select, you know, yes, it's okay, and the dialogue that pops up in YouTube. So we're going to have a similar type of functionality with the mobile wallet, where if you want to log in with Nexus on another website, um, it's going to pop up basically on your device and say, hey, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is, this app is requesting access to your sick chain. Would you like to create a new profile or would you like to use your existing profile? And, you know, click done, right? And one of the really powerful things about this is um, it, it, it offloads a lot of the computation on your, your decentralized application from your actual server um, that's hosting the, the web code to the actual local device. Um, for anybody that's not familiar, the most computationally intensive aspect of running a node with Nexus is generating transactions. Um, and that's by design because, um, you know, if you, if you've logged into a website and you put the password in wrong three times, it, it locks you out, right? You, you can do that with a centralized login system, but not with a decentralized login system. So we had to use computational, um, bounding in order to, to lock that. So we use what's called Argon2, which is a, it's a memory hard password hashing algorithm. It's kind of a, before, prior to it, it was, uh, I think, uh, bcrypt. And then S crypt, if anybody's seen S crypt, they, people call it script in, in crypto, but S crypt was the name. And it's a password hashing algorithm. And that's, that's where the whole term memory hard comes from. Because what you essentially do is you bind the, the, the efficiency and the speed of it to memory latency. So what it does is it kind of levels the playing field so the GPUs or CPUs or ASICs or FPGAs don't really have any difference in, in capabilities. So our password hashing algorithm requires about... 1,000 milliseconds, 500 to 1,000 milliseconds to actually generate the key, right? And so what that assures you is that somebody else trying to break your SIG chain will be bounded by that computational limit. So, you know, based off of an eight character alphanumeric password, um, even if the pin were compromised and somebody was just do brute forcing the password, um, I believe it was five to 10 million years um, in order to actually brute force and attack that so it's got a lot of brute force resistance but because of that brute force resistance it's computationally intensive to generate a transaction just because you're generating your first the private key that's used to sign that transaction and then you've got to generate a new private key for the next transaction right to give it a claim so this is um you know it, this creates somewhat of a, a bottleneck if you're running a decentralized application um and you know there, there's another issue too, where, you know, it, it works right now for like, you know, Beth, for instance, they, they have the login on their node and you generate it um, and you run. And if you're running kind of a private hybrid network type situation, it's not as pressing of an issue. Um, but once we start getting into more decentralized application development, we really want to remove any sort of credentials from being broadcast anywhere. So this login with Nexus does that. It's going you know, to essentially eliminate phishing. Um, if anybody doesn't know what phishing is, it's where you create a fake login page. And then you use that to get somebody's username, and password, and PIN. And then there's other issues too with you know breaching a database. If somebody's able to breach a web service, they get what the password hashes, and then they're able to start using those password hashes potentially, depending on how they salt it, um, or brute forcing against them. So you know there's there's privacy issues too. So what this essentially does is it, it takes that attack surface and it removes it from that central node, and it, it offloads the computation onto your local device. And it also ensures that you're not actually exposing your credentials to anyone. Um, so you can't actually end up getting fished, right? So it's going to make the login systems really, really safe. And that's that's a really important um, feature because it's it really adds a lot of security, but then it gives you a very common, efficient interface as, as a developer to be able to develop your, your authentication system without needing to really worry about all these nuances and details. That's one of our really strong design requirements is you know, make it so easy that grandma can do it, right? Um, and that's that's evidenced through so many people building on Bubble, right? And we'll, we're able to essentially get rid of, you know, OAuth is, is one of the big Google services. If you're ever building a, a, an application or if you've ever built a large application, you know, your authentication system is really important um, because that's really the security of your entire app. This is going to make that just really simple and really efficient. And, you know, it will still require you to submit a signature to their to their application. So, you know, when you log in, what you're essentially doing is you're generating a digital signature 
um, with a timestamp and a nonce, the nonce so that you don't get a replay attack and you're sending that off to their server and then they use that to say, okay, you're authenticated. So you're using public key cryptography to authenticate and that's been, you know, that's similar to SSH. If anybody's used an SSH key, um, you don't need a password, you just have the key and then the key gives you your authentication. And that gives you a lot higher security qualities um, than using, you know, a conventional system. And the big thing that I, I'm really excited about is to not have any credentials exposed externally, right? Um, because that opens you up for man in the middle attacks. If your network's being, you know, spotted on, you know, HTTPS helps, but, you know, you use SSL strip and some art poisoning and boom, I've got your passwords, right? And, you know, logging into stuff on public Wi-Fi and everything. And so, you know, I really, I've really, that's one of our big, you know, fundamental focuses is making blockchain easy for people to use and, you know, make this framework something that, you know, is a powerful framework aside from the blockchain, right? Not, not making it, oh, hey, this is, you know, what you want to use for blockchain, but no, this is what you want to use for web. And it just so happens to have a blockchain to authenticate all these things. So it's been really cool getting in touch with Dino again and, you know, kind of working on that. We're getting more involved in the, the locator identifier separation protocol. And he told me essentially that Lisp is a VPN. It acts like a VPN, especially when you have a reverse tunneling router and RTR. So that's going to kind of tie together once we get our list system developed that will tie in with our whole VPN tunnels. Um, I've looked into the VPN protocols like IPsec, um, OpenVPN. I mean, I'm, I could use one of their pre-existing protocols, but as I went through the protocol, I asked. I'm, I'm really persnickety about protocols. I mean, it is, I'm just like, oh my God. You know, I, I look at all the web protocols and it just to shake my head because it's just, I, I'm not a big fan of plain text. They're like binary protocols, efficiency, you know, I mean, for instance, you know, if the, the 32 bit unsigned integer can store about 4.3 billion places, right? 4.3 billion is about, I think, nine, 10 digits. So it's 10 bytes versus four bytes. So you're almost three times the the actual size and the load, you know, and just because we have the bandwidth doesn't mean we need to necessarily use it. So I'm most likely going to be developing our own VPN protocol, but I have looked at, you know, IPsec and, you know, some other ones, I think I to PSK, um, you know, to, to have something that's backwards compatible with, with, you know, like a, an Apple operating system or something, but I'm leaning more towards just developing our own standalone application that captures the network packets and then forwards them through to the VPN. And then that will tie in with Lisp as well. So that's all, it's all looking really good. It's, um, it's churning. I'm making steady progress. Um, I, like I said, I'm shooting to have everything wrapped up as far as the mobile wallet client mode functionality by Friday. I currently have not fully gone through all that. I've, I've started going through the code and tweaking some of the stuff in the network. Um, but I want to add some additional layers of efficiency, such as adding the dynamic indexing service for people to log in. Um, you know, over the network protocol. And then that also sets our stage two, um, which will probably come in 5.2, where your trust key will actually be used to sign data, right? So that you have some sort of verification that something is authentic, right? And so we can do kind of a, a weighted average per se, based off of your trust to gain, you know, certain insights into the current consensus, right? Such as, um, trust keys can sign off right now, you know, on a checkpoint and everybody can mutually agree on a checkpoint. And if your node um, gets to a point where you have a conflicting checkpoint, then it can go through a, a type of process where it can verify, okay, why do I have a different checkpoint? Is, you know, the consensus of all the other nodes, is this larger? So you get this kind of dual, dual, I guess, capability where, where you can, you can verify, you know, what chain you're on correctly um, from other nodes and their trust keys safely. Um, while you also use the cryptographic proofs in the blockchain to verify, you know, what's the, the highest level of consensus. Um, right now, we, I think it's about 10 minutes per checkpoint. So that's going to really improve network security overall. And that it'll give you finality, which means once a transaction is behind a checkpoint, it cannot be reorganized. So, and another thing that I want to do um, to get the unified time system fully decentralized, um, right now it's decentralized through the seed node operators. Um, and that's just a security quality that I've done until, you know, the trust key stuff and authentication was was built. Now that it's, it's pretty well built, um, not on this update because we're on a feature freeze. Um, you guys obviously want this this update to be out. Um, but on the 5.2, most likely we'll have it so that you can actually sign time samples to one another through your trust key, right? Which will be a really powerful uh, combination. So everything's moving pretty well. Um, I'm picking up the pace quite a bit from here. Um, I'm really happy with how everything's running. It, it's been smooth. I haven't been getting uh, very many bug reports anymore. 
which is showing that we're, we're getting pretty close to that final polish phase. Um, there's a lot of additional functionality as I was talking about variables. I think we have username, PTR, so you can actually do a reverse lookup if you have an address, you can do a reverse lookup to get the actual name that it correlates to, um, or you can do, you know, a forward lookup where you want to, you know, find the address from a specific name record. And then I believe I have a username one where you can, uh, if you can generate the Genesis ID from someone's username. So really, really, really handy little tools, right? Um, that's kind of like the final bow around the whole, the whole, you know, new API. Um, and the market system is running good. I want to add probably a couple more commands um, where we can get, this is something that was requested. Um, I need to add a, a last price um, so that we can, you know, they're working on Nexus market cap right now. So, you know, we'll basically, we're going to have our own coin market cap for all the tokens that launch on Nexus, um, the ones that are traded, um, including NFTs. So that's all working really well. Um, yeah, I haven't had any real bug reports this week. Yeah, it's been nice and clear this week. Everything's been really, really moving forward. No snags. Um, and, you know, except for the Android operating system update, that was a little bit of a, a difficulty that we're, we're figuring out. And then lower level database. Um, that's, I haven't really worked on that very much, but I'm going to sense 2020, just because I had to, 2021, I went in to, um, you know, the API and I had to kind of go back to LLL Tau. Um, but the lower level database, I'm going to be picking that back up probably after I finish the 5.1 release, probably next week, because there's a lot of demand for that as a database service, right? And I, I think that's a really good demonstration of our tech stack as well, um, since it's something that's really never been done before, you know, achieving constant time and a database lookup. Um, you know, I think there is one potential, but it was just a, a single, I think they use... Can't remember what method of hashing that they use, but it, it, it's mostly mostly constant time. Um, what was it? Linear hashing. That's what it. Um, the very very old Linux or Unix kernels had one of those, but it, they're not really extensible. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't manage the data as, as well as we've got it going. So I'm going to be focusing on that as far as peripheral services, um, something that's not directly. Um, in the LLL tau, but as a separate NDB, I think is what we're calling it. Um, I think I have the domain too. I'll have to check it. It might be L, not LMDB, but one of the names we're going to get that released because I've had people as I was showing these benchmarks that want to use it. So I'm basically creating an LLP um, web interface so that you can, you know, you'll have an API into the database. And then that will also be something that, that comes in in the 5.2 release. We're going to have you know, database functionality built into the API so that you'll be able to basically you know, access the database service from within your API if you need to have additional data, you need to offload. And then the really, really important quality of the, the new lower level database is it will support sharding natively. So when we get to the 6.0, um, you'll be able to opt into a shard mode, which means that you'll only have a certain subset of the whole database size, right? And this will also, you know, in the database service really influence that because you'll be able to cluster and multiply your, your database engine really, really easily, um, automatically, really. I mean, it'll be kind of like firing up a network. You fire up one node, that's your main API endpoint. And then when you add more, then that ends up being a load balancer that load balances between other aspects of the shards and to add more, you know, nodes will just basically add more shards into your database cluster. And so I really, you know, I've, I'm a pretty fairly proficient person, technically speaking, <laughs> obviously. Um, and it's, it's a pain in the ass, uh, part of my language to, to configure these servers. I was just setting up an IPsec VPN tunnel the other day. I mean, the configuration is just, it, it's so cumbersome just to get something to install. And then when you get it installed and configured, it doesn't work, right? Um, so there's so many issues with this. I mean, I remember looking, you know, back in the day, 2013, looking into setting up a mining pool and the mining pool software was just horrible. And I, so this is one thing that I've really, you know, made a passion about is to make it auto configure, make everything just work out of box turnkey. You know, I think there's too much software that requires too much configuration, which really limits people's ability to use it. So, you know, I want all of this to just be turnkey, drop and go, right? And, you know, that's what, you know, LXOS will happen in it as well. Um, and 
operating system, um, I've gotten it to boot the SEL4 kernel, microkernel, I've gotten it to boot um, quite some time ago, but I have the basics in there. I've been using a reference operating system open source code, which is kind of an example OS that they built to just get an idea of how to build some of these little microservices. But um, you know, this is a microkernel. So what that means is like, you know, what you're using right now, Linux, um, Microsoft, OS X, either one of them are a monolithic kernel, which means it's one big computer program. So if anybody remembers the Windows blue screen, <laughs> page fault, that, right? Um, it crashed the entire kernel and you have to reboot. So when your kernel crashes, the entire, that's synonymous to your computer crashing. Um, microkernels, on the other hand, has this, this little itty bitty computer program called the microkernel. What we're using is SEL4. Um, SEL4 has actually been used to protect against hacking drones. It's already got built-in memory protection, so it's a really nice microkernel to start with. But microkernels don't really manage policy. They, this particular one only really gives thread scheduling. And then you build all of these additional services as separate computer programs. But you know, inside a monolithic, monolithic kernel, your file system module can communicate with your main kernel and your thread scheduling pretty easily because it's the same computer program, right? But when you have a microkernel, you have to use what's called IPC, inter-process communication. Um, IPC basically is just, it's just a little mini protocol. It reminds me of socket programming. It's like its own little socket. So you know, I've built a little of a protocol, so that's gonna be powering each one of our little microservices. Um, that run in that. And I, I'm, the reason I'm bringing it up is so that you guys can kind of see how I work. And, you know, being, you know, a single developer right now, um, I need to work um, smart. I need to work smart. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I need to work smart more than, you know, you know, I mean, I want to work hard too, obviously, but you need to work smart and hard. So I develop things to do many things at once, right? And so the lower level or the lower level library, LLL, Tau, Tritium, I mean Obsidian, that is essentially the operating system, okay? Um, as you noticed, you know, you install a module into your, your wallet, right? We're building, you know, the, the beginning stages of this, this type of operating system. The only thing that we're going to really need to do when we get, you know, down into the, the bootable operating system is we'll need to get LLL Town to run on there, right? And then we really need to add, like, a root process, which is going to be like your task manager and, you know, we're building a file system, right? So it'll be able to ride on the LLL Tau file system. So all this work that I'm doing on Tau right now will go directly in and work in the operating system. The only thing that is really going to be critical to develop is, like I said, the root process, which is kind of your task management system. And that'll lean on LLL Tau. And then, um, what was it? Um, the, sorry, brain fart. Um, root process, the file system is going to run on that. Um, and I, uh, the, the IPC management system, that's that's another important quality, but uh, the, the software-defined router, thank you. Um, the software-defined router is a really important component. Now, that in itself, um, running it on Raspberry Pis and stuff and getting all that hardware, it's just it's going to be a lot more complexity to start. So I've got Arduinos. Um, if anybody's familiar with those, those are like a little microcontroller. And I've got some 433 hertz um, transceivers. So it's it's not our ideal frequency, but it's something we can use so that I can get two Arduinos um, communicating bytes between one another through those modules. And you develop the Arduino code in C, right? A very basic C code. So I'm building the software defined router on that, on that device itself so that, you know, it starts out, you know, as a, essentially a little mesh device. So. You know, even before we get satellites deployed, you know, running LXOS on your, your devices and having an antenna, you'll be able to form mesh networks just like that. And, you know, it'll run Nexus protocol services. And then we can emulate the satellites themselves by, you know, going through the mesh network to a gateway, right, which can essentially mock being a satellite uplink station and just use regular IP and encapsulate the packets over that. Um, to get more, you know, ground coverage. But essentially, you know, some of the first stages that we'll be able to get to is, is developing your own little, you know, mesh systems, right? And that's what LX, LXOS will really provide you in, in the, the early stages. And that, that's important too for, you know, IoT devices, right? And that's that's really the, the first step that we're developing the LXOS for is, you know, IoT. Because, you know, there's probably a lot of people and for valid reasons will say, well, why do we need another operating system? How are you going to get that market share compared to Windows and Linux and Apple? You know, they, they own and they own most of the market. How are you going to get there? How, how Colin, do you think you can do that? IoT. 
right? Um, essentially, I have uh, some friends, um, world-class hackers, I guess you could call them. Um, one of which, I mean, broke some pretty, pretty impressive things. And he, uh, he and some of the other group, they run what's called the IoT Village. IoT Village is um, a, a village at DEF CON where they're exclusively attacking IoT devices. So once I get the LXOS ready to be running on these IoT devices, we'll be able to run them through tests in the IoT Village and we'll be able to give people you know, certain rewards for, you know, breaking certain things. Um, but, you know, IoT, and I've said this before, but for anybody that hasn't heard it, um, IoT security is just garbage. Um, one of the reasons is because there's a massive disincentive to build high quality IoT devices um, because everybody's rushing to get to market. So, you know, they, a lot of times will neglect, you know, cut a lot of corners per day. Um, I mean, I've heard, you know, my friend has told me that sometimes they still have an RPC that has admin and password to access it, right? Um, I don't know if anybody's seen what's happened with those Nest thermostats, but they've actually been able to use a Nest thermostat to break into your local Wi-Fi. They have really, really poor security, and it's not really well known. And then the second issue with IoT is the apps, right? You need a different app for your smart light bulb and a different app for your smart switch. And you got a different app for your smart doorbell and all these smart, 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 right? Um, this will eliminate that, right? Because having Nexus running LXOS, um, especially once you get to an embedded device, it will just integrate right into your interface, kind of like you have a module, right? So, you know, an IoT developer will develop a, a module for the interface to control it and then basically deploy it on. So just like Nexus right now, you can, you know, make a token and, you know, one, you know, HTTP request or, you know, in the crypto API is done, you'll be able to encrypt a file with just one line, you know, one request to a, a, an API endpoint. Um, the, the framework inside the IoT devices will be the same, right? Where we're going to design it where there's a lot of very important individual features, you know, one of which, you know, being to do mesh. Another one, um, which my friend Amos has worked on too, is what's called power line mesh, um, where you can actually use your power, your sockets to create a little mesh network so that you don't actually have to have radio frequencies bombarding you all the time. And it, it, it takes advantage of the, the sine wave and it, it hits and sends a signal essentially between each one of these 60 hertz um, or 50 hertz if you're in Europe. Um, but it, it's not super, super, super high bandwidth, but it allows you to communicate devices. So, you know, it'll have things built in like that, such as, you know, power line mesh functionality. If you have the hardware for the power line mesh, then boom, you'll be able to have the software that will uh, essentially allow that to, to work. So, you know, the result of that is that all of your IoT devices in your home that you plug into the wall socket will be able to communicate with one another, right? And then they'll also have you know, radio frequency controls, right? And another really important quality of the, the LXOS, and this is how it's going to be pretty near impossible to break these IoT devices or to break into them, is um, it's going to be a multi-factor authentication. So if there's any change in the device state or configuration that's required, it will require two, two signatures. One of the signature that's actually on the device, which that'll be baked into a chip, you know, a potted chip, basically, um, uh, you know, some random entropy per se that's used to generate your uh, passwords and pins, right? Or your, your new keys along the way. And then you'll have a master sig chain that actually controls that sig chain. So you'll need a signature on the device and you'll need a signature on your, your phone or whatever device is controlling that, right? So you won't be able to actually just get into an IoT device and do anything. You won't even be able to change your operating system configurations without an additional signature. So you remove the attack surface from the actual physical device and you move it onto essentially the blockchain. So you'd have to break the cryptography on the blockchain. And this all together is, is tied together in a neat little bow with grandma's just buttons is what Ernie calls it, so that you'll be able to develop and deploy these IoT devices rapidly without much, you know, software engineering required, um, you'll just be able to make a few API commands and all the things that you need the IoT device to do will be there. So the security and the performance of it can just be driven directly on the you know, LLL Tau stack inside LXOS so that it will just become cheaper. It'll become more economical to run LXOS than you know, trying to get some you know, IoT driven Linux version and then add all your different code and then you know, all your RPC this and whatever. Um, it should just be really simple. And, you know, we'll write, obviously, a scripting language um, that you'll be able to write these security scripts in 
um, so that you know, as a developer developing an IoT device, you'll be able to build the device and deploy the device rapidly, right? We'll also most likely have you know, some framework capability for Arduinos as I'm developing the software-defined router and the Arduino will be supporting you know, Arduino type um, you know, code. The Arduino doesn't really have an operating system that you need to run. It's just a microcontroller that processes the byte code. But, you know, we want to add some of that functionality so that, you know, it is, even in Arduino, um, enthusiasts will be able to install, you know, the LXOS toolkit, essentially, um, and use that on your Arduino so that you'll be able to deploy, you know, Arduinos much quicker, too, because those are used a lot for, you know, gizmos and gadgets. So um, that's really how we're planning on getting that market share by incentivizing it, by making it really simple and easy and cheap to use. And then, you know, we get really good promotion through working in the IoT village getting more people to test it, run it. <laughs> and then the software defined router is another really important quality. Now, you know, there's the other issue with the operating system, which is, um, okay, well, what if I have my Windows app and it only runs on Windows, right? I don't want to have to boot this one and boot that one. And I, I don't blame you. I don't like running multi-boot you know, operating systems. I like having one operating system that I know works. Uh, so as I, I've said this before, but for those that, that haven't heard it, um, there's there's an operating system called Cubes. It's spelled with a Q, Q-U-B-E-S. Um, Edward Snowden recommended it. Um, it's, it's a Linux variation, right? It's based off of Linux, but what makes it really unique is it actually runs a hypervisor and allows you to fire up a virtual machine for different tasks. So you can create a cube that's an insecure cube that's its own Linux, it's its own Debian Linux in its own little sandbox in its own little virtual machine. So that if you get a virus or anything on that, you know, cube, you just exit the cube and no problems, right? So we're we're gonna be, the, the SEL4 microkernel comes with a hypervisor built in. So we'll be able to add that virtual machine functionality into it. So when you wanna open up your Windows app and install it, you'll be able to double click it like it's an icon and it'll open up a cube, right? Or a virtual machine running Windows 7. So you'll be able to actually run your Windows applications inside Nexus now, or not inside Nexus, inside LXOS. So <clears throat> same thing with, you know, Apple toolkit stuff, right? Um, and then we'll obviously be supporting a lot of the core Linux library. It's gonna be um, POSIX compliant, right? So you'll have the same POSIX interface. So Linux programs should compile directly on LXOS. Um, and OSX is running, it's a variation of BSD. And the problem is that they have these different libraries that you have to access. So OSX will most likely be in its own cube as well. So you have a Windows cube and an OSX cube, but you'll be able to fire up as many cubes as you want. And the cool thing is you can actually save the state of that cube. So you can exit the cube and then open it back up. And that will still be there as if you, you never turned it off. You won't have to reopen Windows or anything else like that. So that way we can give people the best of all of these things, right? And then it becomes pretty much a no-brainer. Like, you know, if, you're, if you have to develop this whole uh, developer community and apps and stuff, like, I mean, I, I, I don't think it would be feasible. But being able to do it this way, you have, you know, the functionality from Windows, you have the functionality from OS X, you have some of the functionality from Linux, and then you have all these new toys, right? And then a seamless interface where you can connect your devices. And then obviously the distributed nature of the operating system too, where you can, you know, have my phone and my computer and all that share a similar space. And then you just create different spaces for each different device. And then as I've spoken before, two three-dimensional interfaces. Um, I've been speaking with some people um, that have actually developed it. They have a three-dimensional interface that works, and it's it's really cool. Um, it is super cool, um, and they they basically want to develop it into an operating system, but you know they're looking for funding. But then you know they have all this stuff without any backend. So we've been collaborating a bit on that. Um, most likely in the early stages going to, to help them at least with some backend functionality using Nexus. And then we'll be able to lead in from there. Um, so, and they've actually been designing it too with augmented reality in mind. So that's really where we're going. Um, you know, the, you have command line where you type in commands and then you have, um, you know, the, the user interface with buttons and GUI, right? And graphical user interface is what it's called. And then you have, um, this three-dimensional interface, right? That's that's the next evolved state, I guess you could say, of the interface, um, where you you can have it something as simple as like you know a little room 
right? Where you can put like a, a note on the table and open up the note and that's Google Doc, right? Um, or you can, you know, get it into full blown worlds or, you know, your own, you know, little space, right? And you can customize it however you want, or you can run it, you know, as a two dimensional interface. But I think, you know, even simple things like a, a particle effect on a website, um, I've seen people just sit there and stare at the website because they love the visual effects, right? So now imagine an interactive visual effect where you go into a world that is your computer and now your computer isn't just stuck on this one physical device. Your computer exists in this type of hyperspace, right? And then, oh, hey, I have my secure file storage. That's my satellite storage, you know, where I have my very sensitive data that I don't want bounded on the ground. Okay, well, you know, I have that special little folder that's, a, you know, a secured encrypted folder. Um, that's stored, you know, you know, I pay for 100 megabytes or a gigabyte of hosting or whatever, right? And then, you know, from that to that'll be also a requirement that drives the game theory for the satellites in order to have, you know, fully web accessible, you know, domain space, um, you know, that's globally accessible outside of a specific mesh network, you, you need to have it hosted on some sort of satellite system. Um, so that's really cool. Um, I'm also researching some of the other potential uh, applications of the satellite technology, like to what degree of hardware we can really use um, because what I've been seeing is it's really kind of interesting um, that back in the day, right? You know, satellites as, as the, the, the transistors got smaller, um, you'd get more problems in space because you have radiation, okay? Um, there's alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. Beta is what we're gonna talk about. That's like an electron floating around. So if you have um, you know, a lot of beta particles, right, collecting, now imagine you have your transistor, you have, um, well, I'm using MOSFET terms, gate, drain, source, um, but transistor would be base, collector, emitter, right? Um, so your base is essentially what, what switches. Now when it's an NPN transistor, it means it requires a high voltage in order to switch on, right? That's all a transistor is, it's just a high speed switch. A beta particle is an electron. So when you have enough beta particles collect into an area, you're gonna create an electrical concentration, which will create a voltage which then will cause that transistor to switch on when it shouldn't be, right? And the, the result of that is, you know, one number, you know, one zero becomes a one. So if you, let's say, have something stored as one zero, right? That's two, right? There's only one zero people in the world that know binary, those that do and those that don't, it's a nerd joke. Uh, <laughs> one zero meaning two, there's only two people. Um, but let's say, you know, you get a lot of beta particles and that second transistor switches on, now that's three, right? And you don't know that it's changed. So the satellites have to have this kind of check summing where you have to have like multiple processors and multiple memory sticks. And they always have to be cross-checking each other. But low Earth orbit gives us slightly different characteristics. Since you're still somewhat in the atmosphere, you don't have <clears throat> as much to worry about. You're behind the Van Allen radiation belt. So a lot of that gets caught by the magnetic field, right? You're, you're in the atmosphere and the magnetic field. A lot of that gets repelled. But you still get some in. But what they're finding is... You know, the smaller your transistors got, the higher potential you had of those bits flipping, right? Because just the size is had some relationship with that. So the geosynchronous satellites have to be really, really big because, you know, they have to have large transistors. You can only fit so much in. Um, but what's been really fascinating, and, you know, I'm still, I'm still researching and assessing this, but um, as the transistors get below a certain size, you don't have that issue so much anymore. So... You know, not saying we're going to like launch Raspberry Pis or anything, but I am curious and I'm, I'm assessing, you know, what, what levels of hardware we're at, you know, and I'm really designing the hardware, at least in the satellite, to make it as cheap and economical as possible for everyone, right? And that's why I'm also working on, you know, new types of electrical propulsion because that, that allows the satellite to maintain its own orbit. And that also, you know, allows it to get into orbit without the need for rockets, right? Um, is everybody seeing North Korea shooting missiles, you know, in any rocket, whether or not it's just a rocket to carry satellite or anything is considered a weapon. And, you know, they, they can control the, the launch capabilities of that. So even though we're using an ISM frequency, you know, governments are not going to be too happy about people being able to have their own satellites, right? So, you know, having our own independent decentralized launch service is really important. So I, I've been working on that and that's been a really, really important, you know, I think almost one of the more important parts of it is for everybody to have that capability and to be able to launch. And I, I think one of the a really important quality too is space has some way of, it's called the overview effect um, to Haber. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the biosphere, um, biosphere two, but you know, they're, the people that were original experimenters are good friends of mine. And uh, Jane Pointer is one of 
one of them. And she, she actually, she and Tabor have started a, a company called uh, Space View, I think, um, which they're using balloons, which I, I personally, I like the concept, but I'm not sure balloons are the most best way to get to, <laughs> to orbit. <laughs> but they're really, Jane's, you know, an activist and she really wants to help humanity change. And she said that um, when you, when somebody goes to space, and spends enough time in space. I think it's, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes or something. The overview, right? Just seeing the earth from space. When people come back, they become more involved, more enthusiastic. They, they want to help the world. It's a really interesting effect where it kind of takes us out of our limited mindsets where we're seeing just a small subset of reality. And it, it gives you this overview, right? It's called the overview effect. So... You know, the satellites are where we start, but, you know, we need to have propulsion systems that, that don't require chemical fuel. Um, that's why we haven't really been able to get outside of the solar system, because um, you got to carry the weight of your fuel. <laughs> so, but the fuel is what gives you the thrust to carry it, right? So you have this really icky circular dependency um, where, you know, a lot of times, if you remember the big Saturn V rockets, you know, there's a teeny little module and that huge rocket, most of that is just fuel storage, right, for the liquid hydrogen. And I think they use propylene or ethylene, liquid oxygen, ethylene, whatever. Um, oh, no, wait, that one was hydrogen. I believe they used hydrogen, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, oxygen, liquid hydrogen. Anyway, um, all of that was just fuel, right, to carry that thing out of the atmosphere, right? So... You know, finding solid state propulsion systems, I think, will really benefit humanity greatly. And, you know, I'm not sure exactly um, what type of propulsion, you know, let's say other societies, other planets may use. Um, but I'm pretty sure that the chemical fuel is not the way you're going to ever achieve some sort of, you know, intersolar system travel, right, where we can really explore. So I'm, I'm assessing these these electrical effects. They're really really kind of quite fascinating, actually. And I'm gonna one of these AMAs once I get my lab's almost done, um, getting set up. I'll be able to get back in there. And you know, if anyone wants to try it, you you create an asymmetrical capacitor. Um, you basically use a thin wire up at the top, and then you want to make sure you have enough gap um, for the voltage. You want about 40 kilovolts, 40,000 volts. And then a, a big, large capacitor on the bottom and cover it in tin foil. And then probably leave about a, an inch gap or something like that. And then just make that into a little triangle, right? Where you have the, the asymmetric capacitor. And then make the top wire the positive and then the bottom the negative, right? It's called the B-field Brown effect. And when you electrolyze that to 40 kilovolts, right? When you, for some reason, there's this interesting effect. People, some people call it electrofluid mechanics, right? Saying, oh, the thrust is completely off of ionization of the air. You do feel ionization currents, but I have you know, read research and documents of other people that have tested this in a vacuum and it still produces thrust. So there's some sort of interesting electrogravitic coupling going on, right? This, this effect itself, the Bfield brown effect, was first discovered by T. Townsend Brown, I think, in the early 1900s. And then by the time he got to military demonstrations um, by the 60s, then it, it became pretty much there's no more research on it since then, right? It got shut down. And then, you know, the mainstream narrative um, about, you know, the Bfield Brown effect is electrofluid mechanics, but I've witnessed, you know, more than just ionization happening. So if anyone wants to replicate it, you can. Um, it's really simple. You just need balsa wood and 40,000 volts and, you know, some aluminum foil. And so that's, that's their starting place, right? It's about 380 watts per kilogram of lift. Um, each sat is about one kilogram, one to two kilograms. So in order to have the satellite effectively launch itself, we need only about 380 watts, which is not a lot of power to really ask for. So we need to figure out the proper battery capacities and the way to maintain that. Um, and then, you know, the biggest issue with satellites, too, is your surface area, your solar surface area, how much space, um, you, how much surface area you can use to generate so much you know, voltage, um, you know, based on the size of the little microsat, you know, a little one use or 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter, or most likely going 3U or potentially 6U um, for our design. But there's really cool CubeSat design um, where you can actually buy some of these individual parts and components. Um, and they're usually radiation hardened, but this is what's been fascinating to me about 
um, the size of the transistors. But I'm curious too of what the interaction when you when you suspend the object in a strong electric field, right? Um, which you know is potentially going to be what we can utilize to, to produce thrust. Um, I think you might get some different qualities in the way radiation influences the object, right? So we may be able to to do our own radiation hardening with fields. Um, we'll we'll get to that when we get to that. It's really it's been quite fascinating to really study some of these effects. Um, and like I said, the more the merrier. Um, you know, good science is science that's replicated. So if any of you feel like replicating some of these experiments, just shoot me a direct message, and I can uh, send you some of the information on it. Um, you know, I mean, I, I really. Ideally, I would like to see as many people as possible helping on this, right? We talk about building a network effect and how to build an effective network effect. You know, we need to have our own open source research laboratories and getting more and more people involved on that. So um, anybody that's willing to go do some research, you know, if you want to help with some of the hydrogen systems, that's essentially developing our own battery. Um, and it's basically utilizing resonance, parametric resonance in order to extract atomic energy is my theory anyway, um, from the atom. Um, for anybody that's not familiar, I've given this spiel before, but I'll do it pretty quickly this time. Um, you know, the two protons okay, don't want to be pushed together, right? You, If you take two magnets in north and north, they're going to repel each other. Protons is a similar thing. It's called the Coulomb barrier, C-O-U-L-O-U-M-B, Coulomb. Um, that's actually a measure of electrical charge, um, named after a guy, obviously. So you, this Coulomb barrier... Um, you know, in order to force these protons together, that's how you take hydrogen and you make helium, right? You got to fuse two protons together. That's what's you know, supposedly happening in the sun, but I think it's quite arrogant to think that we know what's happening in the sun when you get too close, you burn up, right? But, you know, the idea is called proton-proton fusion, at least, you know, by the going theory, where two protons get forced together and then they form helium. And then you have two helium atoms one of which I believe um, you go through a quark mutation in that phase, which means one of the up quarks turns to a down quark, and so then you get a proton and a neutron, and then those fuse together, and then you get helium-2. And I believe the helium-2s get fused and so on and so forth. But in order to fuse two protons together, um, it requires a lot of heat or some sort of energy to overcome this Coulomb barrier, which I believe it was 10 to the 12th. 10 to the 12 Kelvin, um, which is about a trillion degrees, something like that. Um, somewhere around there, about a trillion degrees to overcome it. So that's why the suns have to be really hot. And that's why there's no such thing as cold fusion, um, because you can't fuse these two protons together without having some sort of heat to overcome this Coulomb barrier. Um, now, once you get these fused together, interesting enough, then they became held together with strong nuclear force. Okay. Now, you could say, pretty logically that you know, strong nuclear force, you know, it only works at very short distances, but it exceeds the Coulomb barrier without heat, right? So it's equivalent of a trillion degrees Kelvin, which we know a trillion degrees is a lot of energy. Um, but yet these all atoms just seem to hold this energy. And that's the foundation of nuclear physics. E equals MC squared. Energy equals mass. And C is the constant for the speed of light. So energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. I'm not sure if that's entirely correct either. It's kind of difficult to measure because you got to make a nuke for it to measure. But, you know, and it's hard to say how much mass you actually lost because, you know, it's a nuke. <laughs> but despite that, it's a reference essentially to the equivalence of matter and energy. Um, so, you know, you have this incredible energy that's binding an atom together, right? And, um, you know, I've found that you can resonate something so, um, for instance, like, you know, my harp over here or my piano, um, if I play a note, it's the same note as like the piano, if I play it on the piano and you should watch this, if you're ever around instruments, like play an A and make sure your guitar is obviously tuned, but you'll see the A on your guitar vibrate, even when you're playing an A in another part of the room, right? They excite each other. It's resonance, right? Um, music is foundationally based on resonance. That's, that's how you get the note. That's how you get the, it's the resonant frequency. You're tuning, you're changing. So everything has a resonant frequency that it responds to. Tesla actually first really did a lot of work on resonance. He created an earthquake machine, is what he called it, um, where you just get an a, a oscillator that vibrates at a certain frequency. And he said he was able to you know, bring down 
um, an entire bridge or a building he claimed he could bring down an entire building with just resonance right um which you know logically speaking you're not really changing the energy input you're just changing the frequency which to me is kind of like a lock and a key when you find this right frequency it causes the the system to release the energy that's already within it right and i believe that's stored in atomic energy so i think resonance depending on how you utilize it is another way to tap into atomic energy without actually having to desecrate the atom um you know i, I don't think splitting an atom and fission is necessarily the, the best method you know it, it's nice that it, it helps you know be a sustainable form of energy but you know there's other issues with it too you know you have all this nuclear waste so you know that's that's really the foundation of my hydrogen research um which don't go around saying it's cold fusion it's not um it's using parametric resonance essentially high voltage parametric resonance so we're instead of pumping electrons to break the water molecule um, which is conventional electrolysis. We're using high voltage signals and in, in resonating the water molecule, causing it to excite itself and, and rip itself apart. And then you run that back into a fuel cell. So you get this nice little virtuous cycle of power, right? And there's some really interesting properties with water, I believe too. Um, I think water has some sort of mystical, magical properties as far as um, I believe it, it in itself is like a battery already. And that's why, you know, you, you want to drink fresh spring water, not like this puddled water that's been sitting there for a week, not just from the contaminants in it, but I think, you know, the water itself will have less energy density. So that's another really important thing that we'll, we'll be needing because that that allows us to to fix a lot of the energy issues. Everyone will be able to produce your own power at your home. And when we get these small enough, you know, they could potentially get down to the size of a double A battery. I've got some concepts that could do that just using tubes in the capacitor and you need platinum as a catalyst um, for the PEM fuel cell. But regardless, the reason I went on that tangent is um, that's a really important quality with the electrical propulsion, right? When we can get this small enough and weighed down enough and produce enough wattage, um, then you'll be able to have that energy on board the sat and the satellite will essentially be able to self-propel and, you know, maintain itself in its own orbit. So I know these things might sound, you know, pretty pie in the sky, but it's just the natural evolution of technology. And a lot of times new technology looks like a pie in the sky when it's being developed. And the reason that it hasn't been developed is because too many people think it's a pie in the sky. Um, to me, it's quite logical. It makes perfect sense and there's a lot of unexplained you know things such as you know uh, there's been evidence of people's ability to manipulate gravity with the pyramids or anything else right you know, no matter what your theories may be or you know easter island for instance you know these megalithic structures that seem to not be movable um you know the beefield brown effect was actually discovered when he electrified objects and he found that they changed their weight right he found that when an object came you know electrified with a high enough voltage it, it, it changed how much it weighed so you know put these things together right and we start seeing you know I, I think that there's a really strong correlation there and you know this is obviously research okay so i'm not i'm not making claims i'm not saying that i figured this all out i'm, I'm investigating these different methods because i believe it's very important for us to have our own propulsion systems, <clears throat> for the satellites to be able to maintain their own orbits, and for us to really remove our, our, our dependency on rockets, right? Um, rockets are cool, but, you know, with them being weapons and there being very few rocket companies, it becomes very easy to control the proliferation of this, this system. So um, it's really, really important um, to, uh, for us to at least have open enough minds to... to be looking at these things and looking at you know what's possible and what's not so i gave some of that explanation for the p-field brown effect if anyone wants to replicate that send me you know some inquiries um i'll, I'll do my best to respond to you um as far as parametric resonance high voltage parametric resonance with the hydrogen systems if you want to get involved on that feel free to reach out as far as satellite tech um you know if you want to help we've got some people that are helping right now um, develop some of the, you know, the antenna systems, but we're looking at phased array antennas. Okay. So um, it would be a big help if anybody knows any phased array antenna suppliers. Um, it doesn't need to be a variable frequency phased array antenna, but we do need about 33 dBi. Um, so we need to start looking around to see if we can find more of those suppliers. Right now I'm using the 433 megahertz RF um, transmitters that are very basic transmitters, but 
um, you know, we, we want to get up to our 5.8 gigahertz transmitters and really improve, you know, that, you know, over time. So phase array antennas are really, really important for this, this, this whole thing. And then, you know, 5.8 gigahertz transceivers um, that support QAM 1024 um, for any telecom people or anybody that knows telecom people. We need to support quadrature amplitude modulation at 1024 symbols. Um, the, the reason being is you get, you get a higher bandwidth for the same, you know, essential wavelength. Um, you don't need to change your frequency. You just, you can fit more bits into each wavelength. So that's another really important quality on the, the hardware side of it. Um, once I get some of these, these tech experiments, um, working better than, um, I'll be sharing obviously videos with you guys. I'll be sharing the video of our, our little, you know, lifters, what they're called. Um, getting it, you know, a little bit airborne and measuring some of the different qualities. They're going to be testing different pulse DCs, um, different voltages, um, different frequencies, you know, and I'm going to be kind of building a bit of a database on that um, to kind of understand that those, those qualities better. And then, you know, the, the hydrogen research, I want to have that, you know, moving a lot more too. These are, these are technologies that I think the world is going to need, you know, we already need it. Um, we're going to need it even more as time goes forward. Um, I mean, look at Cuba, they shut down the internet numerous times. I think they even in a democratic country like India, I think during some of the farmers protests, they were shutting people's internet connections down, um, you know, and then Starlink, you know, whatever, um, you know, it, it kind of works, but you know, it's already got, you know, licensing issues and it's pretty easy to shut someone out from that. What we really need is something that can't be shut down, something that we all own, right? And anybody that's concerned about um, Elon, for instance, you know, being worried about, oh, you're competing against Elon Musk and yada, yada. And it's like, I don't really consider us competing um, because we're doing something totally different. Essentially, he's building a client server model where you, you pay and then you receive your service from that, but you have to buy the hardware and then you have to pay, you know, a monthly fee. We're flipping that and saying, okay, well, I can buy the hardware and I can make money from the hardware. You know, what are you going to choose to do? Right. Um, it'll build itself. Right. And that's really one of the powerful parts of this technology is we really we develop it and you know, it'll get more people involved in using it. And then that over time will, you know, you know, get more people earning money and developing their own little local economies. And, you know, it'll become a really robust communication system that nobody can really shut down. So um, those are some of the, the action items from you guys. If you want to get more involved, some of the things that would definitely help. Um, in, in developing some of these technologies more. I'd like to, to get more think tanks going, um, more people that want to get involved in you know, some of the, the intimate details of, of this tech stack. So um, if anybody wants to volunteer, you know, you just reach out to me or reach out to any chair or Phil or someone and they should be able to get you, get you in touch. So that's about what I got for this AMA. Um, I'm going to go through Telegram really quickly. I'm going to look what we got going on. Oh my goodness. I haven't been in Telegram for a minute. Um, a little bit dinner. Okay. Um, I got some here. Questions. Mining after 2024. Constant amount of mine nexus. Then a division of civilization. Can I explain in detail? Um, Okay, so mining staking post 2024, um, it's going to be one nexus per minute, right? It's a constant amount of nexus that's going to be emitted. Um, it, mining will not be profitable. Um, that's a pretty strong assumption. You can't say mining won't be profitable. Profitability on mining depends entirely on the difficulty and the price and the amount that's emitted. So as price goes down, usually miners jump off and then it becomes more profitable and then more people start mining it. Um, you know, the, the hash rate will, essentially it's usually price dependent. So you know, higher price, more profitability, more people mine it. Um, but the constant emission you know, amount prevents it from having this compound inflation, but it also creates a virtuous cycle where we're, gonna, we're not gonna have the risk of deflationary collapse like you get with Bitcoin, where if too many miners jump off of Bitcoin, the, the blocks won't retarget and it gets slower and you know, big problems can happen. Um, and it relies entirely on the transaction fees. This allows us to have free transactions, um, but then the transaction fees that are for other transactions, you know, for buying a token or something, then get burnt so that it 
offsets the actual, you know, emission from the mining and staking so that, you know, ideally I think we'll, we'll end up at about a hundred million coins and I don't think it'll, it'll go too much. And then, you know, when we can dynamically update our fees, that will allow us to essentially control how much, you know, emission we have. So, you know, if we want to have it deflate a little bit, you, you know, vote on higher transaction fees for you know, tokens or whatever else based off of the total volume. And you can, you know, economically predict that, well, okay, we'll, we'll take 500,000 nexus off of the supply this year if we have the fees be this, right? And so that will allow us, it kind of gives you, for lack of better words, you know, the, the justification of Federal Reserve is that they can control inflation and deflation. They can inflate or deflate based on the interest rate, right? Um, think of it as a, you know, a similar mechanism where it's not a Federal Reserve. It's not like an interest rate. It's nothing like that. But, you know, the supply will be dependent on the fees when the fees are burnt. So um, people in the, the global Dow, with, you know, the trust keys will be able to vote. Okay, I want to, you know, have the supply increase a little bit right now or decrease a little bit based on the transaction fees so that people will be able to kind of control that, right? And they'll be able to pull some of the supply back or, you know, bring it out, you know, based off of this type of global consensus. So um, that's a really important feature, you know, for our long-term economic stability. Is it possible to send tokens from private network to the main chain and vice versa? Not currently. Um, I've been considering different ways to do that. Um, it's not in, you know, it's not built right now. Generally, the way to do that on other networks is through bridges. Um, we're not going any route of bridges, but I am considering some options to be able to, to have inter-blockchain communication um, without having to acquire bridges. So, you know, if we can't do it decentralized, then we won't do it. Um, but if we can, then you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll approach it in that way. Um, Crown Station, what area will be covered on average? Um, I mean, it's all entirely dependent on, you know, what hardware you have. Um, I mean, it just depends on what frequencies, how big your antennas are, your antenna gain, how high your antenna is. Generally, the biggest limitation on how much you know, distance you can cover is the curve of the Earth. Sorry, flat earthers. <laughs> um, it, 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 the signal hits. So if you have the Earth curve like this, you have an antenna that needs to be up, right? Because if it's low, it's going to hit the curve of the Earth. I think it's within a mile. If that, you start already getting... You know, you go over the curve and then you, the, the electromagnetic doesn't follow the curve. It just goes straight, right? So you run, basically you lose connectivity. So that's why you have to have height, right? That's why you want your antenna to be higher is to essentially have that uh, longer distance. So, I mean, I, I couldn't, there's so many factors that's, you know, like saying, you know, how fast will my car be when I buy it? You know, it's, it depends on your engine. It depends on your you know, transmission. It depends on all these factors, right? Um, I'm, it's really just going to be based on what grade you buy. 5.8 gigahertz on average um, with our high gain using high antenna gain. We are able to get 500 kilometers, but, you know, 5.8 gigahertz, you know, it'll probably be pretty locally bound um, depending on, you know, how high your antenna is. But the ground station coverage is, is designed at least anyway right now to be more neighborhood, um, smaller areas. You know, you don't don't want to have a huge area that you cover because you're going to get more, you know, RF saturation of the airwaves and stuff. So I'm designing it to probably be about like half a mile, but you'll be able to, you know, add more of these in different places if you want to start you know, developing your own ISP, right? And that's what essentially it will give people the capability to do is become their own, you know, gateway and ISP. <clears throat> okay. How will the control of a given IoT device be solved by several users? Um, so... If you heard earlier about the IoT devices, um, basically the control of it, you know, if it's a multi-signature access, you know, you have different access control patterns. It's a sick chain. So, you know, you have your main master credential and then the device itself, and then you just add additional people that can control the device. And you include that in your kind of multi-sig, you know, authentication. So, you know, you can space, say, device and, you know, master or device and this or device and this, so on and so forth. And it's just you use this, this simple access control patterns in the same way um, that you would for a two-factor authentication. NXFS file finder in what version? Um, I don't understand what you mean by file finder. 
Um, it's maybe it's, it's, it's such a generic question. You got to be really specific with me. I mean, I'm thinking of like what, like search, or are you talking about like a little window that you open up? Um, I'm just going to skip that question. How is it planned to solve the problem with the volume of the Nexus database that is being updated? The wallet now is a little over six gigabytes. It is known that it will grow in the past. These values may not be able to be handled. Um, yeah, the database size, if, if you heard earlier um, when I was talking, um, I mentioned about the sharding and the lower level database and shard mode will be available in 6.0 where you'll be able to break it up into a different subset of the data set. Um, that's how you handle it for a full node. For a client mode, you really don't have much more than you know half a gigabyte to a gigabyte required to run client mode. Um, and that isn't a very large requirement depending on the, the transaction volume, it doesn't really matter. How does the number of transactions affect block size? Um, right now, we don't count the actual size of the transaction. We just count the hash itself. Um, OK, with implementing 3D, how does the number of affect block size? Essentially, you're not going to have, don't, Jacob, don't think about it like as a block. Um, think about it as layers of proofs, right? So you, you get this three-dimensional block that holds all of this data but it, it's not stored in this block, right? This block is kind of like a series of hashes that then you can take a Merkle path to, to say, okay, I have this piece of data, which is a transaction. It's got a hash. I can find what part of that it goes and I can get the Merkle proofs all the way up. So you get a Merkle proof through the layer one and then Merkle through the layer two, and then that can go to the root cube. So you'll nice have this nice little Merkle tree that will allow you to say, okay, well, all I need is, you know, the final root hash of the three-dimensional block, and then I can connect any piece of data into it. Um, you know, the transactions themselves will be stored on the L1 layers where you'll have different shards that hold, you know, different subsets of that data set. But, you know, it won't be a requirement to, to save all of that all the time. You know, it can be offloaded onto more local users. Um, it can be held for a certain amount of time. The proofs will still work. It will all be driven by, you know, Merkle proof. So you won't actually need to hold that. You'll be able to prune that out pretty quickly over time. Just checking. Yes, that's in Russian. I can't read that. Thanks. Where is the same lifestyle? Will p 2 have required Nexus fee? Um, peer to peer API won't, won't have a fee. Um, you'll essentially just be able to send it like a normal protocol message. Um, it's not going to actually require a transaction. That's what's really beautiful about it. So you get fees when you're generating a transaction. If you're uh, initializing a crypto API or you know things like that, then it will incur a fee. But otherwise, it's just going to be a free protocol message. So you won't really have to pay any fee for sending peer-to-peer -peer messages between one another because it's not really a huge, huge requirement. The big reason we have to have fees is for the economic model. And also to just reduce um, the ability to attack, right? We, we need to have, you know, we don't want to make everything free to, to build an asset. Otherwise, people are going to just load up the chain. So the peer-to-peer -peer, um, messenger API doesn't really require any of those security properties. It's really just I'm opening a connection to you, right? And so there's just going to be no fee for it. Um, how will 2FA be different for current auth from API perspective? Um, the API perspective, so it for one doesn't won't need to be um, authenticated right or sorry it won't you won't have to have two-factor authentication enabled but if it is enabled basically what's going to happen is you'll have one you know you generate the transaction from one person you'll put in one set of credentials on that and then it'll detect that that's a multi-factor so it'll you know give you your your tx id or <laughs> at least say the transaction is created and broadcast it to another separate memory pool and then your 2FA device will pick up and see, oh, okay, I need to make a signature for that. And so then you'll have to make a request on the other device. So you'll have an API command to say, you know, you know I guess we'll put it in the sessions API sessions. I, I don't know the exact command yet, but you'll basically say, hey, you know, list me transactions for this session um, that need to be signed. And then you get those and then you'll be able to sign them. You can also have that offloaded on the, the notifications processor. So what It'll feel like from the API side is you'll, if you set it up to automate, let's say you have both accounts unlocked, you have two nodes, both of them are unlocked, ready, you know, unlocked for multi-factor. So it'll automatically create that. You create the transaction on the one node. 
you broadcast it, it'll broadcast over the other one, the other one will sign it and then it'll ping it back and then you'll get the TX ID back. So you can do probably five seconds, maybe four seconds. It'll pretty much feel automated with that um, because it's really cumbersome to like have to copy the raw hex and then transfer it over here and then sign it. And like, like I said, auto configured, right? It needs to be really smooth. So, you know, if you don't have it unlocked for, you know, that processing and notifications on the other device, then you'll be required to go in and list the transactions to say, hey, list, you know, transactions that I need to sign and then sign, 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 sign. And then once that's done, then it'll ping back to the other one. So, you know, it'll be pretty quick. Um, you know, it, most likely most people have both unlocked for staking, but, you know, if you have a new one or not staking, sorry for, for processing the 2FA notifications, but, you know, if you don't, you have to manually go through it. If they do, it should just drop it back right so you'll be able to send and we'll, we'll be able to send the peer-to-peer -peer api as well um since you'll have another you know that's most likely how we'll do it is we'll open up a connection to the other 2fa device and then that that becomes your initial authentication the 2fa device responds and then you, you know submit you know yes or no on that side you know from the user interface side we do the yes or no but from the api side you know you you know uh, what would it be profiles create uh, or profiles verify transaction or profiles authenticate transaction or whatever ledger authenticate transaction one of those and then you just get the tx id and then so it'll it'll be pretty smooth and pretty easy and i mean it, it makes sense to have you know kind of thinking out loud um it makes sense to have you know the the device required to be online at that moment so you know when you have 2fa um we may have it where you you require or you know the default setting would be you require a peer-to-peer -peer connection to the other 2FA device in order for that to be authenticated and created so that you can just exchange all that data on that one channel and then it's just one single API call um, in order to have that executed. Um, did I miss any questions? Are there... I think that's good. Proof of reserve. Um, I'm not sure what proof of reserve is in reference to what's your question, um, let's see. Essentially, the best I can answer that Zinovsky, Zinovsky, sorry if my Americanness screws that up for you, your name. Um, proof of reserve, if you, if you have a moment, we could shed a little light on that. I mean, there is a reserve system in there, but it's not like Federal Reserve or anything, and it's not even a, it's not like a, an account or anything. It's the reserves have nothing to do with accounts. They're just totally, all it is is just a number that says this is the maximum amount of Nexus that can be minted in that time period. And then a, a small amount is actually added to that every minute so that that regulates how much the miners can mint from there, right? There's a fee reserve right now too, which means all the fees as they accumulate, the fees are accumulated into this reserve. I think there's, 100 or 200,000 Nexus accumulated in the fee reserve, but it's not spendable and it's not an account, right? Um, you, the only way to actually open up that fee reserve is if we do a hard fork and that's you know based off of some sort of consensus that we agree on how we want that. I think the consensus as it is now has been to burn, burn the fees, um, but we'll probably still keep the fee reserve there anyway, just to um, maintain essentially the the amount that you, you're actually removing from circulation versus the amount that's being emitted. Um, so the proof reserve, I'm not sure exactly. I'm gonna, I haven't really <laughs> developed anything like that. We have the reserve system just to maintain the, the supply, you know, that, that can make sure. I, I developed that because um, I, I designed it where the block time is independent of the actual emission. So like with Bitcoin, for instance, if you start mining Bitcoin twice as fast, um, then the, the emission is going to be twice as much, right? But with Nexus, that will deplete the reserve and then your block rewards will go down so that you maintain a certain amount of emission, which cannot be deviated from. So, you know, 10 years from now, we will know exactly how much Nexus will be minted by miners and stakers and all of that. Uh, we are Nexus. Wrong crypto, yeah. I think so. Yeah, he did ask about Nesco, but I figured I might as well just do my best to answer it. <laughs> Is there any other questions, guys? Um, or are we 
we doing pretty good. And are we about ready to wrap up? It's about, about an hour and a half. You can speak it over. over. Hey, Carl. Uh, this is Audrey. And Great talk, man. Oh, busy. You. Mega busy. Uh, quick question yeah. uh, with regards to the peer-to-peer -peer contracts. I know there's a lot of going on. We have 5.1 already in testing. Is it going to have fees similar to just in contracts, 0.01 Nexus? Are you talking about the peer-to-peer -peer messenger API? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. That's going to have no fee. So um, it's free. The only fee that you may incur is if you have to update your crypto object register. But essentially, it's a free service. I'm opening up a, a direct socket to you. You're really not even doing it on Nexus. You're just using Nexus to tell me where you are, right? So when I establish that peer-to-peer -peer connection to you, I'm actually connecting directly to your computer. So the only thing that we'll have to build infrastructure-wise to, to overcome is NAT traversal. If you remember network address translators, um, in order to do that, we're going to have a reverse proxy. So if you want to become, if you register in the peer-to-peer -peer messenger system, you're going to be making an outgoing connection to this reverse proxy. The reverse proxy will be a seed node of whatever kind. And so then somebody else can access you right there. And then that will give us 100% NAT traverse without having to deal with NAT PNP, um, PCP, or UPnP, which are port forwarding protocols. So, you know, I'm designing it to be free. Um, for everyone, you know, I feel it's 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 pretty frictionless. It's the only times that you really have to pay is when you're you're actually adding data to the blockchain, right? But even then, like if it's a regular transaction, you don't, right? Just for the the natural, you know, debits and credits and stuff. It's like creating assets and tokens and stuff like that that, that incurs a lot of the fees. Does that does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, that's that's great. I mean, it makes a lot of sense too. And the second yeah. question I have, with, regard, with regards to um, two-factor authentication, how will it be different from existing authentication? Are we going away from the username, password, and PIN, or is it just going to be merged somehow? Are you talking about, like, the remote login when you, you log in with Nexus? E yeah, like, I know, I mean, I'm not following, because I'm kind of busy. Um, yeah. You already mentioned it during this meeting how you remote login, the using, like, what was it? I forgot what you mentioned, but like basically two factoring session. Yeah. Tokens. Yeah. So if you've seen the passwordless login, like SSH is, I guess, a good example of it. You, you'll type in your username. Let's say, let me just run through a scenario of what it'll feel like from the end user and then tell me if this, this needs more explanation. Um, I'm going to go to a website. Let's say it's an email service. They say, hey, log in with Nexus button. I click log in with Nexus. It's going to pop up and say, type in your Nexus username. I type in my username or my Genesis if I want to paste that. And then it's going to do the little circle. And what's going to happen on your mobile wallet, it's going to pop up a little notification that's going to say, hey, this app, blah, 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 dot whatever, dot com, is asking for permission to access your sig chain. Do you want to create a new profile or do you not want to allow this app? Or do you want to use your existing profile? You'll have like a little checklist. Okay, I want to create a new profile. <clears throat> then your mobile wallet will create a new profile, a new sig chain, right? Under that credential. And then send a key, like a signed message back to their server. Their server is going to receive that signed message. They're going to verify the hash or the username hashes to the genesis. The genesis was signed. You do a quick lookup of their crypto object register. Obviously, their web service will be running Nexus. Boom, you verify, okay, this actually exists. This account exists. This you know, signature is a valid signature from the crypto object register. Now they let you in the app. Um, then let's say you're inside the app and you want to send a token to someone to their email, to their email address, and that's something that that supports. Then <clears throat> depending on your configuration settings on your, your device, it will say, you know, you can say, I want to click I want to accept everything that's required, or I just want by default, this is, you know, given full permissions to this profile. And then what's going to happen is the web server is going to send a request back to your mobile phone to say, hey, I need this and this and this executed. It's essentially going to kind of act like, um, uh, I guess you could kind of like a proxy, a proxy API load balancer where you're making the request to their DAP endpoint, which is their API but then it's forwarding that API request into your actual local node on your device, right? And then that will spit the transaction back to them. So that way you don't expose any credentials, but then you use the public key cryptography, you leverage that from the crypto object register to authenticate everything. 
but the blockchain requests actually get offloaded onto the local device, which, you know, as a developer, I'm sure, you, you know, like, you know, server scalability, right? When you're building an app on Nexus and you want to run multiple people logging in, you know, it's going to work as long as you don't have too many people trying to create a transaction at once, because otherwise you're going to load down with the Argon2 hashing, right? This way you offload that computation on each device, but then you never actually expose any credentials. All you have to do is just make a simple signature to verify that. So, you know, people won't be able to hack blockchain or hack your blockchain through any main web service. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Just got a quick follow up. So on like on that so you, like you said to have a pop up user clicks on he puts a username, he clicks, and that signature sent to the local like the mobile app, right? To the wallet. You yeah. have to be logged in into the wallet. Yeah, so you'd have to have the wallet open. Right. Or at least have, you know, it connected where you can receive requests or notifications. You know, you know, when you get a notification, you click the notification, it'll open it up. And so it'll feel kind of like a 2FA device, right? Like if, for, if you've used Gmail and it's asking yeah. you to verify, you click yes in your YouTube app. That's that's the interface that I'm modeling off the functionality off of. No, it's perfect. So I will yeah. follow them. You say yes. And then I, I take it that local node on that device is going to send back the response to the server. Bingo. Where, yeah, and where it, it came from. Yeah, and it's going to send a signature too from the crypto API. So, or your crypto object register. Your crypto object register is just a bunch of hashes in it. So, you know, one of those hashes would be your auth key, which is the hash of the public key. So what you do is you send a signature off with that public key, right? With the signature and that public key and then signing some sort of nonce so you can't get a replay attack. And then the server receives that and then it hashes that public key and checks that hash and then hashes the username, gets the Genesis ID, does a lookup for the crypto object register and make sure that those hashes match so that you can verify that it actually is a signature and a public key that came from it. So it acts kind of like a public key server, right? So that you don't have any of these issues with, you know, person masquerading. You don't need public key servers anymore. You don't need certificate authorities. That's what that crypto object register is for. And that we can also use for, you know, self-signed certificates too when you get to HTTPS. Um, you just hash that certificate and then include that hash in your crypto object register. And now your service can have an SSL certificate that can't be forged, right? And doesn't require a certificate authority. As you've seen, there was the, some recent BGP hijacking attacks, I think, on my Ether wallet, where BGP is BorderGate protocol. You can basically announce to BorderGate protocol, hey, I own these IP addresses now. <laughs> um, and, you know, if you get enough people supporting you, then they start routing traffic through your, you know, <laughs> new devices. And they actually got a certificate authority to give them and issue them a certificate off of their fake IP addresses that they BGP hijack. And now you have, you know, a recipe to steal people's ether out of these ether wallets. And that happens. And that just happened many times. So even certificate authorities, you know, don't really always work still, right? They're, they're a security measure that helps, you know, authenticate what key is what. But, you know, the crypto object register gives you that additional quality. And that's one thing the crypto API does too. So it's going to really, it'll make it really seamless. That's the design requirement, you know, is to make it really seamless for a developer to have access to all these things without needing to deal with OAuth. But then it acts kind of like a password, you know, a, a, a password manager for the regular user where you only have to really remember these one set of credentials, but then you never type it on any foreign device. You only log into your mobile wallet, right? Which, you know, is safer than, you know, all these other random computers. So you never actually expose credentials and you never have the potential for actually getting fished too. Will this work on a desktop mobiles? I mean, desktop wallets choose. Yep, any more. I mean, it's just going to, you're going to set up another node that can receive that. Yeah, so you can be running your, your desktop wallet or your mobile wallet or whatever. And as long as that, that, you know, version of the software is checking that list, you know, of authentication requests, you know, that's all you'll have to do. You know, you know, Kendall and Crystal okay. will build that into the wallet. Where can I have a follow up question? So if, if the user, yeah. if somebody knows my username and they try to use that, am I going to get like spammed with, authentication requests is it actually possible then um you could if somebody tries to spam your specific wallet with that yeah that's a good point i mean if somebody does know your username you could get requests that that are sent to you but what you can do is you can have it you know a specific unique identifier for the website and when you click reject right and say no um, then it blocks all future requests coming from specific site service. So in order to do the effective spamming, you'd have to have a new domain for each spam request, which is five bucks per request, which, you know, wouldn't really mean anything. So you, you yeah, can, but like, 
yeah, I understand. Don't worry. This is a, like a, this is a real problem for everybody who does like say World of Warcraft because they have similar system. You, what you describe is basically like what Warcraft, World of Warcraft does. You log in and they just ping you, hey, is this you or Google does right? And you say yes and you log in. So which is great because that's why I was thinking about for Nexus to do the same thing, but like manually. And you guys are doing it, which is the right approach, I think. Or like next step of evolution for authentication for sure. Yeah. But like they can spam, you know, like all the Chinese hackers, they know my uh, username. They're like, oh, because it's going to go to my account. Like, hey, somebody's trying to log in. Is this you? Coming yeah, from so the same domain. It's, this isn't going to be um, somebody's trying to log in, blah, blah, blah. It's not, it's, that's going to be part of it, right? But what the biggest part of this is the registration of a new actual app, right? And that registration requires some sort of unique domain name. So in order to do that. Oh, yeah. right, right. I see what you're saying, yeah. You have to buy a unique domain each time. Um, as far as spammed requests, I mean, you can block an IP address if you reject it once. I mean, generally speaking, when you when you log in, you'll have your cookies. You won't really need to re. You can use to re-request your authentication or re-verify your authentication or you know refresh the session if you need, and then that that can put a you know a request on. But you're going to need to have yes, yeah, some sort of basic IP filtering. Um, once you reject and request, you request it, you know, obviously distributed denial of service attacks are a problem for everything that, you know, could potentially be a problem with something spamming that. Um, but, you know, even knowing your Genesis ID, you could try to, to engage in that. But the biggest thing would just be the registration of a new DAP, you know, and somebody could try to put blockchain requests to you. But then, you know, you have, you know, we'll have systems in there where you can actually, if you reject a request, it's going to reject other faucets of that request, such as the IP address, you know, if it's an additional request from the same IP address. So, you know, in order to effectively try to do that, you'd really need a botnet and do denial, distributed denial of service attack. But if you're at that caliber, then it's, you know, spamming somebody isn't going to be as big of an issue. But I, right. I, I like thinking and I appreciate that, that, that perspective on that. But yeah, we'll definitely, definitely putting protections in against those types of things. Cool, cool. Thanks. Yeah, man. We write Nexus username, isn't it make threat to account security? Um, Jacob, somewhat. I mean, you, you don't necessarily have to give out your username if you don't want to. I mean, it's part of your credentials that are created, but it's, I wouldn't say that's like the entirety of your, your Nexus security. Like I said, if your PIN number was compromised and your username was compromised, to break that eight character alphanumeric password would take five to 10 million years. So you still have a pretty significant um, security, but if you if you don't want to expose your username, um, you can just paste your Genesis ID in there, but the username is there to just help. And you need some way to identify that your account is linked to some sort of, you know, blockchain identity. So you'll, you know, if you don't like using your username, you can just use your Genesis ID and paste that in there. And then that will do just the same. Um, but, you know, for your regular user, we need to have a grandma just button. So where you can, you know, type in your username at least and have some sort of access that way. Um, the username isn't a critical part of the security. And since it can't be changed, um, it's, it's not as critical. It's used as a part of the generating of the, you know, the entropy and creating your new keys. But, you know, the, the security is really on the password and the pin rather than just the username. The username is kind of more of an identifier, but I just added it in um, as a, a type of salt into it just to, you know, add additional security, but not to rely on it the security yeah actually uh, this is important to me because i don't want to uh, in my case for, for the game right is that i don't want uh, users to log in at all i want to handle wallets through the server uh, on yeah. like on the back end i don't want to expose any of that stuff they can log in through whatever and i just maintain their wallet on my end they don't even know it's, they're using nexus for any transactions at all okay. like that so i just need to know that the username login and pin is still in play because if it requires two factor authentication, that will be a little bit challenging for me to. No, apply. you can change. I mean, the 2FA is just going to be a script. So I'm writing a virtual machine for um, the, the specific thing I was just talking about there is remote login, right? You can still run it as single login directly on your node, and that doesn't matter, right? This is just to add an additional security for the login with Nexus. Then the two factor authentication system, as I was explaining a little bit earlier, that's an additional thing that you're going to essentially have to modify your SIG chain in order to do so, where you can create different access control patterns where you can say, you know, this set of credentials has this access to my SIG chain, and this one has this access, or require and both of these in order to access 
if that makes sense. So you'll be able to run everything in classic legacy mode like it is now um, without having all these new features will basically be new potential features, but they're not, you're not going to be forced into using them. So you can just keep using it as you use it now. Great. Great. Um, in Iceland, there's Raskfliss. You somehow set it and activate it in bank and Raffer is tied with your social security identification. So if you want login government website, you type in your ID and on your phone pop up screen, we accept that it's you and you logging in with your identity, just saying maybe you can watch how it works and we'll bring some ideas. Um, cool. Thank you to Kof. Um, I'm assuming you're in Iceland. That's, that's cool. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll look into that. And obviously anybody, you know, you know, I, John and whatever, if you guys, if you guys have suggestions or you have ideas or, you know, these, these types of questions are really important. Um, Cause you know, I, I like to develop this openly with everyone else. So if you have, you know, any future requests or, you know, you know, concerns about new features that may mess up some of your code flows and everything, please, please speak up and I'm happy to accommodate. Right. It's, it's, I don't, I know what I know, but I don't know what I don't know, right? And I don't always know all the ways that everyone's going to use this. I know how to build these things, but, you know, it helps to have these feedbacks. So, you know, Chakov, keep it coming. Um, Ajian, keep it coming. Those are really good good things to talk about. I appreciate it. Yeah, there's going to be a lot more of that in, uh, next year, probably. Uh, you know, my biggest picture is, like, let's lower the nexus fees. <laughs> That's all I really, really want uh, whenever possible. I know it's eventually going to come up, but, yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. And are you gonna? Are you gonna be? You have a database engine, I'm guessing, in your game, right? You have some sort of embedded database, distributed database. Yeah, it's gonna be like it's going to be like a hybrid. It's gonna have the regular database uh, and Nexus as a another ledger. I'm Would you just... rather? Oh, sorry, I interrupted. What was that? No, like so, it, the Nexus blockchain is going to act like a financial wallet ledger, and everything else for the game is going to maintain its database. And there's like interplay between the two blockchains, uh, between the database and blockchain. Like... And you need to use you need to use some sort of distributed database cluster for synchronizing different aspects of the game, right? Uh, not. I don't, I'll try to minimize complexity as possible. Okay. Mostly, it's going to be. Like yeah, I want to, I don't want it to fully rely on a blockchain. So it's going to have some elements. We're just using the Oracle database, basically. Okay. Um, if you were using a, a database service, um, like an LLD database service, would you prefer it to be integrated into the LL Tau API or as a separate service? And if it is integrated through API, that'd be great. Great, like, cool. That's what I was thinking: is building a, an LLD API. So that you can access all the functionality of the LOD, fire up your own LOD instances, so on and so forth, programmatically through the LLL tau, but then also a separate um, database service that has its own JSON protocol that allows you to you know, replace Redis or something like that if you just want a standalone database engine. But I figured blockchain developers or people using LLL tau will probably want some sort of database functionality that also it creates shards and it can act as a distributed synchronized database as well, right? Which means other nodes. Other, you know, those nodes could potentially be, you know, servers that you run for your game can synchronize that data set and, you know, essentially have your own, you know, database clustering automatic. But I, I felt like I, that. I mean, yeah, that would, be, that would be great. I mean, I haven't seen lots of documentations on the database in there technically on, on the Nexus. I know, I know there was a lot, a lot of the queries in the department. I haven't probably uh, understood how to use it because it, it uses assets, right? You, we query through the assets, but you need to register an asset. So that's one nexus down. So if you have a million transactions, variations of every single asset, I'm going to go broke before I even start, you know, yeah, playing. Yeah. Well, what I'm saying is you, you'll be able to actually fire up your own database cluster aside from the nexus blockchain itself so that you'll be able to, instead of having to rely specifically on assets in order to, you know, put some data into the chain, you know, you'll want to use the asset if you need cryptographically enforced data, but, you know, the LLD service will essentially allow you to say, okay, well, I have this peripheral data that maybe, you know, is linked to an asset. Maybe I have an asset that has, you know, a list to, you know, some sort of, you know, list of a hundred or a thousand entries. Those hundred or a thousand entries can be existing outside of Nexus uh, for free, but they link themselves and associate themselves with Nexus, if that makes sense. So we don't actually. Have yeah, it does make sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I would definitely play around uh, for sure and see how it works out because, cool. you know, yeah, 100%. Sweet, sweet. Cool. Thanks for the feedback, man. Um, 
Brian Barber. I think the Nexus username is like the public key intended to be public. It's how we interact with other Nexus users. Um, yeah, Brian, that's 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 a it's it's a decent way to see it. it, it it's like a public key, um, but you know it is somewhat meant to be public, but it's meant to be like semi-public. You know, you don't need to reveal your your you don't need to reveal your username in order to interact with other people. You can just give them your Genesis ID. But, you know, if you want people to send to your, you know, username account, you know, they'll need to use your username. But if, if you want to anonymize your username and you don't want to give it out, that's where you can create a namespace, right? So you can create, I think someone made like a send.2 namespace. So you could just, you know, send.2 biz, right? And then people can send to me, um, to my account without actually needing, you know, to know my username, right? So it really just depends on your level of security and how picky you really are with that, and, you know, how much you want to really give your username out or not. Um, it does help augment your security, you know, somewhat to, to leave it concealed, but it is designed, yes, to be some sort of public information that's used to identify people and identify sick chains. Um, so there's really no way around having some sort of identification. You have to have something to identify someone somewhere that has to be some sort of public record. So yeah, that's a good way to see it. Will there be an update in pricing for minting NFTs in the future? Um, yeah, we've talked about that, Sohan. Um, right now it's a manual thing, but uh, I'm planning once we get you know, closer to 7.0, we'll be able to have a vote where we can all vote and to change the price fees. So right now the prices are derived from hard-coded values, but when it's done, you'll be able to essentially pull the price from, or sorry, the, yeah, the cost from an asset, right? So there'll be system assets, and then we'll be able to modify the state of these system assets through a collective vote. So that in order to change the fees, it will just require a transaction, right? And a vote um, so that we'll be able to dynamically update. So Nexus will be able to bootstrap itself, if that makes sense, from its own data. And that's a really important quality so that we won't really need to do hard forks to do a block size upgrade or anything else like that. We'll be able to just do it right on chain through just updating that, that value in the, in the register. How difficult will it be to make partial payments to a tokenized asset on circulating supply compared to max supply? That is not trivial, um, Arun, just because the way it works um, right now is it doesn't really need to know the state of anyone else. It doesn't need to know token holders, right? You don't need to run, iterate through all the token holders. You just need to simply have a proof of how much you own, right, of that token, and then you claim your piece of that from there. But the problem with the circulating supply is that the only way I can see doing it immediately is, is locking when there's a tokenized asset, which means like a tokenized debit, like I, I send this debit out, you're gonna need to lock that from, from being withdrawn because what you could do is you could go <clears throat> take the circulating supply and then move some out and then move it back in and then use that to game the percentages, right? So if you base it off of just circulating supply, then, sorry, I have to pick my kids up from school. Um, if you change it off of your circulating supply, then you can change that supply before everybody's fully claimed their amounts and it's based off of you know what's in that register. So I, I'm, it's not trivial, and I, I recognize the need for that to some degree, but I think there's a small need, and then there's just, I don't know. I mean, I don't even know if the, the engineering required to make that work is really going to be worth it. Um, you know, I, I understand that's one thing that people have requested, but you could very easily alter your application logic. Um, without having that be a requirement just it just gets really 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 messy and the problem is that if you do something slightly wrong then people can just print coins right um, so like right now you have to have your temporal proof expire which means like you can't claim funds like okay if somebody sends a split dividend i have 10 tokens um, and then I send five of those tokens to someone else, you know, that person that received those new five tokens is not entitled to that dividend payment, right? Because what you could just do is just send to your account and then send back to yourself and send back to yourself and back and forth. And then you're going to basically print money, right? So by the way, it's designed to keep it really efficient and function well, you know, it's, it's there, but I'm not sure if it's necessarily worth it. So I haven't really thought too much about, you know, designing that in to be there, um, you know, the only way you could really do that is to say that the token itself is locked um, on that circulating supply, which means, you know, once there's split dividend payments, then you cannot withdraw from that token contract until everyone has satisfied that. But that's going to cause more problems than you're going to solve because you're going to be able to say, okay, well, now I can just be an asshole, you know, pardon my language, and just send partial payments of 0. 0.00001 nexus to this token contract and then they'll never be able to withdraw coins out of the contract right and then i'll never claim those funds and so they're gonna lock everything so you, like i said you create more problems than you solve 
Um, I'm, I'm not really sure that it's necessary to. Um, if you guys come up with a really good justification for it, you know, go for it. I just don't see why you would need to have that. You know, it, uh, it, I guess you just you create as many tokens as you want, but then when there's a dividend, you know, you, there's going to be really no need to to not be paid for the tokens that are there, right? I mean, you just move. You're going to, like, let's say you're a company and you distribute 20% and, you know, you have 80% in your token contract. You know, you're going to want that 80% to pay you, I would I would presume, right? Um, but, you know, if you guys come up with some good justifications for it, you know, let me know. I just, I can't justify the additional complexity and thought and, you know, potential security issues too with it. Um, just for such a small, simple thing that, you know, doesn't this seem somewhat trivial where right now, you know, you're, you're, the coins come back to you, right? You know, to the sender um, that weren't, you know, issued in there, um, which, you know, I guess could make sense if you don't want, you know, some of that. I mean, it might just make sense in the early stages right now to just make it, you know, right now I'm not checking for a token when I'm satisfying the temporal proofs. I believe the actual core protocol doesn't allow that to, I'd have to double check. I'm pretty sure it has to be account, but I think you can use a token for it. Um, but, you know, it just doesn't really make sense right now. Um, you know, I'll, I'll still keep considering it, but if you guys come up with some good, you know, reasons of why you feel you need that above something else, um, you know, I, I can do some more consideration on it. Um, anybody else have any additional questions before we uh, close? I got to run and pick my kids up pretty much now, so it's probably a good time to jump off. Yeah. Or on Conrado. Cool. Well, I can take one more question and then I got to run. If anybody has a quick one, I think Conrado is coming on. Hopefully, uh, it's a reasonable question. <laughs> um, yeah, I got one minute. I want to build a home with IoT. What system can you recommend? Um, Conrado, I, if you want to play around with IoT, look into Arduino here. Arduino Uno. It's a really cool, simple device. Um, it's a little microcontroller, but there's lots of different little um, gizmos and gadgets you can get for the Arduinos to make them. I mean, I even found like a piezo electric for the Arduino because I was going to make an LED, LED light up for my heart so that whenever you strung, uh, plucked a string, it would, it would light up an LED for that specific string. And I mean, you, you get things like a piezo electric sensor that then runs and you just plug it into your pins. So Arduinos are really cool. They're really simple. You have to code a little bit for them, but there's lots of, uh, there's lots of information out there on them. Um, they get reasonable battery life. It's just like a little teeny thing like this. Um, that's that's what I would I would look into using. They're they're small, portable, easy to code, and there's a lot of stuff for them already. So you know, I'm building like a little water flow sensor. I mean, you can get little LED screens or LCD, sorry, liquid crystal displays, um, all sorts of stuff. So that's 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 a microcontroller I would look at using right now. Um, it's just fairly powerful and pretty easy to build. Okay. Well, I gotta go pick up my kids now. Or is it closed system? Um, I believe it's closed. I don't think it has network functionality. Um, it's just a simple little microcontroller. So it's a little programmable microcontroller that you can plug different peripheral devices on. It does not, by nature, have any connection functionality, routers, network, any of that. If you add the ability for them to communicate, you have to get modules for it. So like I've, I've got the 633 megahertz RF transmitters um, that I'm using to design the routing system for the Arduinos. Um, but I'm just using them because they're nice little portable. And I have a little GPS module for them too. So I can take the GPS module information and plug that and then choose what to do with that. But you have to learn a little bit of C code for them. But you know, it's, it's not too complicated. There's a really nice toolkit for them. <sighs> okay. Thank you, uh, Adrian, for the good questions, too. Um, and thank you, everybody. I guess we will uh, plan on doing it again um, in two weeks from now. And next Thursday, one week from today, we have a joint budgeting session. So we're going to be um, having the developer chairs and ambassador chairs. We're going to be discussing what our current budgets are. Um, we're Essentially, we're going to be breaking our budgets into ambassador branch budget and developer branch budget right now. 
it's 55.33. So 33,000 Nexus to ambassador branch and 55,000 Nexus to developer branch. Um, this is going to be the time where us developers, you, you as a community, will get to have a good understanding of what our current budgets are, our current cash flow. Um, and you know, you guys can chime in too if you want to have some sort of input. It's ultimately the the resolution is going to be voted by the chairs, um, two of three branches. So <clears throat> the judicial branch will be present. I'm I'm the current judicial representative for the developer branch. I'm and also chair of the tower arm. And then you know Phil is the current uh, ambassador judicial representative. And then you know Radiant um, or Aaron, if you've seen him, he's the current chair of the jury. So. Um, if there's a dispute in this 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 budgeting process, you know, let's say developers and ambassadors, you know, they cannot agree, then the judicial branch steps in, and the judicial branch, you know, will vote between the chairs. So I think there's Francisco, Aaron, myself, Phil, and I think that's it. And those will issue a vote to to kind of break the tie, right? But it's been pretty smooth. The last few times that we've done it so it should be a fairly quick joint session but it's essentially just a simple joint session to continue the financial transparency with the community give you guys some input into you know you know the, the input will be given to the chairs and then ultimately we we're going to issue a vote and ratify the next quarterly budget and then then that quarterly budget then is split between the arms of each branch on a monthly basis between the chairs and their vote Right. So this is something that we've been, excuse me, been slacking on a little bit. <laughs> um, I don't think we've done one for about six months. So we, this ideally should be every quarter. So we're, we're getting that flowing again. Thanks to Phil. He's been really helping. And, you know, anybody um, that hasn't seen how much he's been doing, um, Sleeping Buddha, Phil, he's, he's really done an incredible amount. He's taken so much off of my plate he's been helping with a lot of the drama and incidents as those happen so make sure to give some thanks to phil too he's been really awesome he's been doing this all as a volunteer he's been totally kicking ass um it's gotten me totally not involved in ambassador affairs anymore which is much more peaceful for me i get to just focus on code i've been getting a lot more done um, and, you know, it, you know, it keeps me insulated from all that type of stuff, too. So yeah, just make sure to, to give a, an extra thanks to Phil for being such an awesome judicial representative and to Aaron for being an awesome uh, chair of the jury. Um, he's this just it's dirty, mucky work. And then to Francisco and Lexi for being awesome auditors. Um, we're going to continue those audits monthly. Right. So if you're in any branch or any chair or whatever, like be be prepared for those because we're going to keep them flowing. I think we've got it budgeted for three or four per month. I think we just finished our initial assessment of all the arms right now. Relationships arm is regenerating. Um, but yeah, yeah. So just, just wanted to say thank you to, to all the people that have been helping and dedicating so much of your time. Thank you to the community for being involved in this project, for giving inspiration to me. Um, thank you to all the developers for, for working with us. Thank you guys for being patient. Uh, as things have been getting done and uh yeah overall like thank you for for being here and wanting to affect a change in the world and being a part of that change so yes on that note we're gonna close so thank you everybody <laughs>